Wednesday night. In your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21. We're going to begin reading at verse number 9. Amen. I have to tell you, I'm not really sure how um, this thing goes, because this, this passage is just a lot of fat. Yeah, it's a lot of building stuff. And so we're going to be going through. We're, we're starting to look at the new Jerusalem, at the holy city tonight. Amen? Come on, stand with me for the reading of God's word, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Here, starting at verse number nine. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I'll show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names were written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west, and the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a golden measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out in a square, and its length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with the rod 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. He measured its wall 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. It's nice to know, isn't it? A little trivia fact for you there. The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, and the tenth chrysopate, the eleventh jacith, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Father, thank you for your word this evening. You give us a lot of information here about our future home. And um, it ought to get us excited about being there. It really ought to. This is something that no matter how we read about it and imagine it, you said it, it hasn't even entered into the heart of man, w all the things that you've prepared for. As much as we can imagine, it's going to blow our minds when we get there. And uh, we thank you for the clues that you've given us, and we ask you just to open your word to us this evening, that it may just, just give us a glimmer of what awaits us, just a glimmer of what awaits us. And that glimmer cause us to want to tell somebody else about a future home they could have as well. And we'll thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. You can be seated this evening. Well, um, let me ask you this as my niece pulls up. I have a um, slide thing to try to help put things in perspective for you, a PowerPoint for you this evening. And uh, as the curtains draw back on that, boom, I have got a nice name for it, New Jerusalem, a.k.a. also known as the Holy City, the Bride of Christ, the 12 foundation stones, the walls, the streets of gold, and you get the idea. It's a lot of stuff right here in these, in these verses, right? 
And so let me just ask you this. If, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. When the New Jerusalem comes down, where is it going? I mean, it's got to land somewhere, right? I mean, it, uh, right? So it's got to land somewhere. Where is it going to land? On the new earth, right. Any particular place on the new earth? Any, can we know, what? Jerusalem. Mom says Jerusalem. I got to be honest with you, that's what I've thought all these years and start I, until I learned to do math. And I got to tell you, it isn't going to fit. All right? It's not going to fit there on the earth as it currently is, which means... Uh, that's right, there's not only a Ju new Jerusalem, there's a new earth coming with it, correct? So I don't know what the new earth is going to look like. I don't know what the land masses are going to look like. The, the earth prior to the flood was different too. Scientists tell us that. If you look at a globe that's all flattened out, what you notice is all the pieces kind of put together like a jigsaw puzzle because they said it's this thing called transcontinental drift, right? In fact, even today, satellites and the mapping, GPS and all that have to be recalibrated so often because the continents are still drifting apart so much every year, right? And so they have to be uh, changed. I, I don't think that's why my GPS tells me to take a wrong turn every now and again and I wind up down a dirt road and, and all of that. I don't think that's the reason for it. I think that's poor programming, but... The fact is that the continents are still moving as a result of what happened and what we believe was Noah's flood, right? That it used to be all put together just like the jigsaw puzzles of the globe suggest it did, right? Maybe it's all going back into one landmass again because at the beginning of this chapter, it says that there's a new heaven, there's a new earth, and boom, there's no more sea. I don't know what the new earth is going to look like, but I know this, that the new Jerusalem isn't going to fit where the present Jerusalem is. Uh, uh, it, it's going to be just way too big. There's a lot of figures tonight, and so we want to just go on with, with with it and there's a couple of words that you need to be aware of here and one is a transparent one's translucent one's clear as crystal all right uh, and so as, as we go through uh this here so john says i saw the holy jerusalem the bride is that is confusing in and of itself is is the is christ married to a city No, he's married to the church, right? He's married to the church. And so when it's coming down, I think what he's looking at is the people, uh, what the angel is showing him, the new Jerusalem, and I think it has people in it. He, that's the only way it makes sense because Christ isn't married to a city. He's married to the church. We're the bride of Christ, right? And so this is coming down, and he says the city have, has the glory of God. Listen to these words. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Verse 11, having the glory of God. Having the glory of God. Those words are important. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. He uses a really particular term here. In fact, it's the only place in the Bible this one term is used, uh, clear as crystal. He uses it to describe the aura that's coming off of the city of Jerusalem as it's coming down, this, the, the holy city coming down. It's, a, um, it's not transparent. Transparent means you can see through it. Translucent means that light can pass through it. But what he says here is that it's clear as crystal, and he actually uses a, a word that means um, like making icicles. So if you've ever seen your, your favorite Christmas Hallmark movie, and they're always in a place with lots of snow, you ever, I mean, forget the fact they all end the same way, just go 
with me to the icicle part of it, right? And you see those icicles, you can see clean through them. They're clear as crystal. That's the image he's projecting here. And uh, that that's the aura that's coming off of this place, having the glory of God. Brilliance like a very costly stone, but then he puts in this. It's a stone like jasper. Well, jasper isn't clear. According to the 1911 Encyclopedia Britannica, um, jasper in antiquity was always associated with emerald, with the color green. It's a yellow greenish color. Remember I told you a few weeks ago, when we get into this section, you're going to see God's favorite color. M- Got to be some form of green, right? Because there's a lot of green in this. Uh, this ore that he's talking about is a yellow greenish color because he said it's like jasper, but it's crystal clear where you can see through it, right? Just as clear as you can an I- a clear icicle then, right? That's how he describes this. You wonder why would it be that color? Uh, I'll tell you here coming up. Just hold on. So here's the Jerusalem. (laughs) This is why I say it won't fit, all right? So you can see um, here is, uh, where's my, there it is. You know what? My pointer doesn't go on this new TV, does it? <laughs> goes all the way around, does not go through. It's like a magic trick, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, okay. Well, all right, so let's pull out my other pointer. Yeah, okay, yeah, even better, a drumstick. So we'll go to this one. Here, all right, so I've got this uh, red line here. So if you were to put Jerusalem smack dab in the center here, right? Here's Jerusalem. Here's Israel right around here. So we're going to start in the bottom left-hand uh, corner right down here. You know where you're at in here? You're, you're all the way through Egypt, and you're under the top of Sudan over here. Then you're going to go across this thing you might have heard of it called the Red Sea right here. You're going to go all the way through Iran on this side. Here's Iran. Then you're going to start going up through the Persian Gulf right here, the Gulf of Persia here. You're going to go up through Iraq here on the side. You're going to go into the Caspian Sea here, (laughs) almost all the way up here to Turkey. Uh, Here's Turkey and here. And then you're going to start going across. You're going to go across Russia here, across the Black Sea, all the way over to here to Romania, then down through Belarus, then down through Greece, uh, back through the Mediterranean, and back down to the top of Sudan right here. You're right at the border of the Sudan. That's just the footprint of the new Jerusalem, just the bottom floor of it, just one area. You're talking about, I don't know, somebody calculated it'd be a million square miles just on the bottom. I didn't figure all that out, but I trust David Jeremiah. He did. So, but that is, that. but that's just the footprint of it, right? If Jerusalem is in the middle of it today, that's why I say it doesn't fit. I've got a bigger globe up there. You can see the square up there and how much land mass this thing takes. It is huge, this, this city that is coming down. Why is it so big? Why is this so? Because there's a lot of Christians to put in there. You got all the Christians all the way back from uh, Adam and Eve. Think Adam and Eve are going to be? I mean, we just can't go back to the cross. we got to go all the way back, right? Adam and Eve are going to be there. And then you've got um, Abel is going to be there. I don't know about Cain, but I'm know i pretty sure Abel's going to be there, right? And then just keep on going down the lineages of all the people who are going to be in this city. That's a large city you're going to need for everybody who wants to live inside the city can live inside the city then it's going to be a much bigger earth uh, than for this to go on to you know if you were to 
let me just say this. It's, it's a cube, too. It's not, just, it's not just how wide it is as a square. It's also, it, the Bible says its height is the same as its width right and it's depth so it's actually if it's 1500 miles on each side it's 1500 miles high let me put that into perspective here for you just just a bit right um the space station orbits the international space station orbits 207 miles above the earth so if it's coming around when that lands it hits, and then you still got 1,300 miles above that to get over it, right? 1,300 miles above where the International Space Station is orbiting right now as we, that's a high building. You know how much mass that takes? Um, the holy city is about the size of our moon, when you take all of that mass there, it's slightly larger than our moon is now. The one that you walk right outside and you go, oh, that's pretty. Look how big it looks. Imagine when you're standing right next to it. A couple years ago, we went to the ark, right? My wife and I, were on our vacation. We got RV and we're coming down in from Ohio down into Kentucky and we stop at the ark. And that thing was gargantuous. It's like three football fields long. It is huge. And you stand, and I've got pictures of her standing like a couple hundred yards in front of it. And that thing still looks like an ocean liner, right, to, to, to her. It is just absolutely gargantuous. And yet, it pales. In com I, I was so mesmerized. I stood right at the base of it and pointed my phone, my camera straight up and started to take pictures going straight up. Can you imagine the height of this thing? Going straight up 1,500 miles and being about the size. That's why the earth has got to be a lot bigger than what it is now because everything that has size, has solid, has mass, and everything that has mass has what? It's called the gravitational pull, right? And so that's why the moon plays around with our tides now, high tide and low tide and all of that. What's doing all that is because our moon is just the right size. Well, imagine something the size of the moon now resting on the earth at its present size. Probably not going to work out well. Just saying, right? Not going to talk about tilting on its axis. It's just going to like whatever. Whatever side the holy city's on, just going to go straight, not tip it right over. It, it just can't work that way, right? Because it's so big to house all of these people that are going to be there then, right? So then he starts talking about these 12 foundation stones. And uh, the, the 12 foundation stones, now it's got to be remembered that... Um, the, the foundation stones are adorned with these gems. It doesn't say they're actually made out of these gems. Uh, um, John actually says that they are adorned with these stones, all right? They're decorated with these stones. And then each foundation stone itself has a particular stone that it's adorned with all the way around. And so there's jasper, and there's sapphire, and chalcedon, and emerald, and carnelian, and brill, and amethyst, and jacob, and topaz, and chrysolite, and chrysopase, and sardonyx, and all of these. I just want you to notice uh, how many of them have the color green in them. And I think your pastor's on to something. When he says his favorite color is green, he's going to really enjoy heaven. Right? Yeah, your two? Yours is green too? Uh, well, there you go. Hey, man. You, you, you're, there you go. Okay, how many now? Uh, your favorite color is green now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Converts all over the place. Praise the Lord. Right? Yeah, and so oh, they, now some of them have this deep blue to them. Some of them have this red to them. But, uh, but there's... There's a lot of it that go on. And then when you start to see this, you begin, what did I say at the very beginning? That he said it's like jasper. 
It's this yellowish green ore that's coming up that's transparent or that's clear as crystal as it's coming down. And it begins to make more sense than when you start to see all the yellowish green colors in, in all these stones that are in there. That it's just, and he sees this as a light, as an ore, having the glory of God, something that's exuding from it then, uh, all right? Here's something interesting. Um, your human eye. I did some study on how we see colors internally. And you, if you took a science class at high school, you know that um, we see with rods and cones in our eyes, right? There would be certain rods and cones, uh, and then they are the ones who pick up color. There's three primary colors. Although if you look at the um, color printer, um, little ink things. One's going to say magenta or cayenne or something like that. Don't believe it. All right. There's three. There's three primary colors. You know that. There's yellow. There's red. And there's blue. Right. And then there are secondary colors to those things. Out of those three colors, then uh, red, yellow, and blue. Then you have the secondary colors of orange, violet, and green. And then all the other colors start coming out of these colors when you start mixing and matching and all of these type of things. All, all of the other colors. Now, if you, you start with three colors and then three secondary colors, how many, uh, how many colors can your eyes see with those rods and cones that God has equipped you with? All right? Assuming you're not colorblind, um, how many colors can you see presently right here in this world? Uh, you can see about a million colors, one million shades of color that are all originating out of three primary colors, yellow, red, and blue, right? Um What if God made one more primary color? Just what if? Because when you read this and you read all these stones, you know what you you know what you begin to heaven is a really colorful place. And it's a brilliantly colored place. It's not just that there's a lot of colors, it's brilliantly colored and everything is transparent or translucent, or crystal, clear as crystal. That's why the crystal sea is described as the crystal sea. It's clear. Sometimes you look at these vacation spots where you can see down so far in the water because it's so clear. It's not going to hold anything to what the crystal sea is going to be in heaven, right? It, it's just it's brilliantly colored. It's lit up with color. It's dancing with color. It's alive with color. In fact, I, at the very beginning of this series, 14 sermons ago, we started by talking about evidence for the afterlife, and we started talking about NDEs or near-death experiences and people that have gone to the other side, had a glimpse of heaven, and then come back. And what they say is they can't describe the colors. Artists can't recreate the colors. And it seems even more than that, that the colors are alive, that the colors exude the love of God, that love is actually in the colors. They're exuding uh, the glory of God. They're alive uh, in, in this magnificent color realm uh, that we're getting ready to go to someday. All of these colors uh, are brilliant colors. They're colors that just jump out at you that when John sees them, he says it's like having the glory of God. And why would he say that? Well, if you remember, John was one of the three that's on this Mount Hebron when there's this episode that takes place we call the Transfiguration. In the transfiguration, Jesus is changed in front of him. And the description of him is that his clothes became shiny, right? He 
began to shine with the glory of God, with his real nature, so that light is coming out of him. In fact, John says that his clothes were so white as no launderer could make them. It's shining out. I know a guy who calls this episode Shiny Jesus, the Shiny Jesus story, right? And it, it's a perfect name for it because John has seen the glory of God. He's one of only three people on that mountain that day. And when he sees the Holy Spirit or the Holy City coming down, what's he said? That's like having the glory of God. I think he's thinking back to the Mount of Transfiguration and the way the light was just shining off of Christ on that mountain and exuding from him and coming out and just dancing around on there so that they all fell down before him. And he sees this city coming down. He's like, you know, that's just like having the glory of God because he had seen it on that mountain. So, um, we have this, ref- the streets of gold, um, we'll get there in just a minute. I want to tell you this first, though. This great high wall that he talks about, because he gets to that first. And so there's, he says, there, I just want to say, that it, 72 yards is the measure of it. It doesn't say whether that's high or whether that's deep. We know it's not wide because it's got to go all the way around the city. So it's either going to be high or it's going to be deep. And I I don't know which because he doesn't say. He just said he measured it at 72 measure and then gives you that awesome trivia fact that an angelic measurement is the same as a human measurement. And and otherwise, it's a big wall. It's a high wall. It's a wall. And, And the only thing that I would say about that is God isn't against walls. Just saying, all right. God isn't. God hasn't got anything against walls, and and because He's recognizing the need for a restricted place, right? He said, "No sin is ever going to enter there. It's walled off. You can't get in, right? Nobody's ever going to. It's the and and it's not that there's a need to keep somebody out. They're already in hell. But it's the it's the symbol of this is a restricted place, and I've got angelic guards at each gate one guard per gate Uh, then 12 gates are all the way around there's three on each side north south east and west there's one angel per gate every gate is a pearl a single pearl and one angel guarding it because it's a restricted place heaven is and nothing unclean will ever enter there no sin will ever enter there and therefore, he can say there'll be no sorrow, and there'll no, be no crying, and there'll be no tear, and there'll be no death and dying, and no more parting, as the song says, over there. As we sung tonight, it's interesting that um, every gate is out of a single pearl. You know there's only two gemstones that are organically made? One of them is a pearl, and the other is coral. Right? Those are only two gemstones that are organically made. Now, I personally don't want to wrestle the uh, clams that, or oyster that this, these, these ones are coming out of here. These are some big pearls that are coming out because each gate is one single pearl that's coming out. He said, well, Pastor Jim, don't you think that's symbol? I don't know where the line is between symbolic. He says that that's what it is. And by the time you start saying, well, maybe it just means something or maybe it's symbol. I don't know where you stop with that then. All right. I don't know where the line is. Say, well, we can stop with the symbolism. No, this is what he says. It is John said this. Now, what's he going to tell John when John has written all this down and he's told him to written it, write it all down. John gets up there and it's different. And then he he goes, well, what, what did you show me that for? I wrote that down. Now everybody thinks. 
you know, you know what I'm saying? So I think it's going to be what he wrote it in, down. What he, it's as advertised, uh, a single pearl is going to be at each gate then. 72 yards, these unbelievable colors. And then we get to the city itself. And he says, that the city is 1,500 miles in a cube. We've colored that. Or we've covered that. And then it says, then the streets of are gold. We went to, in while we were in Europe, we went to some really fancy castles. I mean, Louis XIV really had a thing for gold. I'm going to tell you, you walk into his place in France, I mean, bankrupted the country over it, but it's okay. We got the gold, right? And so he, he, it, everything is gold in this palace. It's it's so much gold, you, you get tired of looking at gold, right? It's just like, oh, there's another gold thing. There's another gold vanity. There's another gold staircase. There's another gold wall. There's another gold this and that. It's. It's just gold everywhere. But there's a difference in that gold and this gold. You see what he says about this gold? He says, and the streets of that city are pure gold like transparent glass. Now let me ask you some, something. When was the last time you saw gold that was so pure that it was like transparent glass? Yeah, you probably never have, right? Doesn't matter how much you shine your wedding band up, you're never going to get it to be transparent, right? But gold is different than the gemstones. You know how? Let me tell you. Gold is actually an element. It's not a compound. All the gemstones are compounds. That means it takes more things to make them. they got to be compounded together. An element is a single atom, right? All the atoms. Thank you. Thank you, we got a science buff right here. Katie's agreeing with me. Yes, yes. Gold is on the periodic table if you're into chemistry, all right? It's a single atom. If you've got pure gold, all the atoms are the same in there. And the, the periodic table, the symbol for that is an AU for that. It actually um, comes from a Latin word called aurum. Right? The Latin word arum actually means shining dawn. That's how gold got its elemental um, symbol, A-U, shining dawn. Then with that, all right? Um, uh, here you go. Water is a compound, all right? Hydrogen, two parts of hydrogen to what? One part oxygen. Both of those are elements, but you got to take two of those and put them together in the right combination two parts hydrogen to one part R H2O you've heard of that and the water right it's a compound it's not an element hydrogen's an element but gold is an element all the other gemstones they're all compound stuff here's something that makes gold unique it's gonna go a long way to explaining this ore that that John saw as the holy city is coming down and he says it's like jasper this, this yellow greenish, just this aura. It's like having the glory of God. It's this light shining up. It's, it's all that. Here's something interesting about gold. It's the most malleable metal in existence. All right? Malleable um, um, and ductile, right? It, the ability for it to be stretched, right? One ounce, a single ounce a pure gold can be stretched uh, into a thread five miles long. One ounce. That's how ductile gold is, right? No other element comes close to that. It can actually be used for thread, for weaving clothes together, right? If you, if you get some of your fancy um, clothes that are wore by some clergy, they'll actually have gold threads in them, right? It, it's really, or royalty will have gold thread 
in in it. You can, um, it, it is malleable, talks about. How easily it can be hammered into thin sheets. So what the same one ounce of gold, one ounce of gold can be hammered so thin, 300 square foot sheets of gold that are transparent. Oh, transparent, you say. Yes, transparent as in they're so thin. But you know what happens when they get that thin? They give off a yellow greenish hue then. Ha! All the way back to the beginning, and he sees this city coming down, and what's he see? It's like jasper, this yellow greenish hue, but it's shiny and it's transparent. And it's like having the the glory of God in it, right? And it's just coming off, and because of the pure gold that it's used. Now, I don't think God needs to hammer it thin to get it transparent. I think he just has really pure gold because it's an element and he makes it the way he wants it. Right? He he made it in the first place. He doesn't even have to and he, and if he he can make more of it. It's an element, right? So here's the Here's the thing, then, as we wrap this portion up, I told you, it's, just, it's, it's a lot of facts tonight. Heaven is a place that is going to be so colorful, it's going to be unbelievable. The colors are going to be alive. They're going to be descriptions that I've read of dancing. Like the love of God is filled through them. It's going to be a place that you don't want to miss because you can't get in on your own. There's a wall there. There's guards there. There's guards there day after day because there's no night. So you can't say not day after day, after day because it's just all day. But there's a guard there. There's only one way you can get in. There's only one way you can get in, and that's to come in with the blood of the Lamb. It's the only way that you can get in there is to come by the way of the cross. There's a song that the choir sings um, once in a while, every couple of years, and it's called By the Way of the Cross. That it's nothing I have done. It's all because of God's Son. And once you accept that gift, then you live like it then you die to self, as Paul says, and you live for Christ, and you let Christ live his life in you fully every single day because this is worth it. Luis Palau died just a couple of years ago as um, Lee Strobel was writing his book on heaven, and he got to interview him just before he passed away, and he said, Luis, when you get to heaven, if you could if you could send a message back to Christians on earth, what would your message read? And he said, I think I'd write, go for it. You're never going to be sorry for being bold for Christ once you get here. You're never going to regret being bold for Christ once you walk in there. He said, oh, Lee Strobel said, oh, that's a, that's a good one. He says, listen, if you could write a, a, just a text back to unbelievers, what would it say? And Luis said, I think I'd say, don't be stupid. <laughs> All right? Don't be stupid. Because you don't want to miss this place where there's only one way you're getting to. Because this place is the ultimate, and you got to know somebody to get in. All right? 
There are some places like that here and now where you got to know somebody to get into that club or into that restaurant or to get a reservation or to get that job or whatever. I'm going to tell you, this place, it's the ultimate on you got to know somebody to get in there, right? And there's only one person that you have to know, nobody else, and his name is Jesus. And the last thing is, If you knew you were going to take to go to this place, wouldn't you like to bring somebody else along with you? I mean, wouldn't you like to be able to bring somebody else along with you? I mean, maybe not at the same time, but have a reunion up there, right? Have a reunion and say, I'm so have them say, I'm so glad you, you told me about this place. I'd have never made it had you not told me about it, about the guy, about Jesus who got me here. Wouldn't you like to have a reunion like that? There's a song that we sing sometimes. It says, Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul for me. And may I ever do my part to win that soul for thee tell you something this place that's worth it this place let's pray father thank you for your word this evening thank you lord that this is a word that is yea and amen it's true it's something that we can bank on it's something that we can look forward to it's something lord that we can be excited about it's something that takes away our fear of death because we know where we're going to this place 